Greetings. Hello and welcome back to the Indian Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Raj Balkaran, founder of the Indian Wisdom School. And you, you might be looking for living wisdom that you can apply to your life, perhaps encoded in story. If that's you, <laughs> you're in the right place. Uh, today's story um, features a student named Galava. The student was a devoted pupil of the great sage Vishwamitra. You might remember that name. Vishwamitra, of course, was the once king engaged in a feud with sage Vasishta over the wish-fulfilling cow. He, being a rather greedy, uh, egoistic king, desired to possess the cow, and he was not able to, um, to, to win, to conquer neither the cow nor Vasishta. He realized that spiritual power is greater than social power. And so after great tapasya, after great austerity, Vishwamitra became a self-realized sage. So this is the sage who is the guru of Galava. Okay. They came at the end of Galava's training. He was set to graduate from his years and years of Vedic study. And what does this entail? Well, in traditional times, such teachings are dispensed free of charge. This occurs in society where the needs of teachers and sadhus are met. The society has an awareness of this, a consciousness to take care of those who have renounced vocation, renounced wealth in order to pursue the supreme, in order to pursue spirituality. And so that um, trope is not entirely commensurate with modern Western society, so innovations need to be made. But nevertheless, it's useful to know that in ancient India, and to a certain extent in even modern India, uh, not so much in the diaspora, though there might be some exceptions, we see that uh, householders, earners, take care of those who have renounced earning for the sake of learning or churning, spiritual burning, as it were. Um, but in olden times, at least in the literary imaginary, um, students would give a dakshina, a ritual fee, a donation to their teacher, almost always at the request of their teacher. The teacher will request a particular dakshina either because of a particular need, or if the teacher is, um, <laughs> shall we say, more on the alchemical or tantric side, um, the request might be a response to the student's karmas or an opportunity to test uh, in the middle of the student, test the worth of the student in a sense. Right? So, Galava is about to graduate. <laughs> And so, of course, he was prepared to offer the dakshina, the customary ritual fee of his teacher's choosing. But this was, of course, being dispensed in compensation for years and years of unrelenting and um, compassionate tutelage and care. So, Galava asks uh, Guru Vishwamitra, you know, what do you desire? And Vishwamitra replied that he was content he didn't desire anything. He wasn't looking for a ritual fee. He was good, thank you. But Galava did not accept this response. He said, well, well, surely you, you must require something. I'm, I'm required to give you something. What is it that you want? Surely you want something. What is it that you want? Now, given that Vishwamitra was once a mighty king who became a great sage by Shiva's grace, he was still prone at times to a bit of a royal temper, not nearly as much as Sage Durvasa, as we'll learn in a subsequent tale, who is uh, ornery indeed. But nevertheless, the vestiges of Rajas <laughs> in uh, Vishwamitra the Sage. So after Galava's incessant prodding, um, prodding prompting uh, regarding a gift, Vishwamitra sharply responds just to shut him up, okay. So, since you insist on giving me a gift, then I request you pay me for your training with 800 horses, each as white as snow, each with one single black ear. Go and fetch me the gift you're so eager to give. 
<laughs> familiar with the sage's temper. Oliver backed away easily. <laughs> backed out of the situation. Paying his respects. Uh, <laughs> now confounded as to how to procure the gift of his teacher's choosing. Because now he's bound by this request. Now, it's interesting, right? This is a conversation I have with loved ones from time to time, whether I'm the recipient or the giver of the gift. Folks seem to have a really hard time understanding that the gift you're giving is not for you. It's for the person to whom you're giving it. And so you are wise to understand their needs and their wants. You might take a dear friend out to dinner. You might be a vegetarian and they might quite enjoy steak. So what will you buy them? Tofu bits for dinner. Or you might be carnivorous and your your dear friend might be um, vegan. What will you buy them? Oh, it's your birthday. I have to get your birthday cake. Dude, I'm pre-diabetic. I'm, no, no, no. We have to get your birthday cake. It's your birthday. The person is just caught up in the trance of their conditioning. You know, it's like they really want to give you a gift and it's really more about them than you. Can you really empathize with the person and understand what their wishes are? That is the, that is the premise of a gift. Right? Now, I think we can all see the misstep that Golova made in egoistically insisting on giving a gift because then it stopped being about Vishwamitra. It was all about Golova and his need to give a gift, right? So he realizes how foolish he, <laughs> he had been to have demanded to give a gift. It was his ego that insisted upon it. And he understood why he received the punishment of this impossible task. Punishments are not um, vengeful as the divine punishments or punishments from gurus are not vengeful. Typically, as they are uh, often construed in an Abrahamic context, they're pedagogic. They're not like an eye for an eye or you need to be punished because you've been bad. They're, they are, what can I teach you? A guru's punishment is always pedagogical. Otherwise, he's not exactly a guru. <laughs> right? The symbolism of the horses was not lost on him either. They represented the status of his training. Oh, what do you mean? What do you mean? The status of his training, what are you talking about? Well, they're all white. Think of white as purity, as emblematic of purity. Kalava is like this horse where he's pure, except one piece is black. One piece is yet sullied. His ear. <laughs> he needs to work a little bit on his listening skills. Right? He needs to listen a little more clearly and heed what is being said to him. He's not uh, bowing before his guru out of fear or out of giving up his power, but if his guru is wise and spiritual, he's actually um, he's actually deferring in reverence to the divine presence. And what is the point of having access to the divine presence <laughs> if we cannot receive it, relate to it, because we are caught up in ego? Yeah. So, anyways, he has an arduous task before him. The penniless scholar, of course, he spent his entire life so far studying, could not possibly afford one single horse, much less 800 horses. So he thinks to himself, how can I solve this problem? A little bit of creativity, a little bit of grace. Let's see what we can do. It's a little bit of an adventure. Well, he knows that there's this king called Yayati, who's a great and generous king. So he pays a visit to the court of King Yayati. The king <laughs> suggests that he approach his daughter Madhvi. She had been granted a very unusual boon by her grandfather Shukra. Shukra is actually the planet Venus. Um, Madhvi is, is the uh, granddaughter of Venus himself, Shukra. Shukracharya. Shukracharya is the guru of the demons, actually. Uh, Brihaspati is the guru of the gods, that's Jupiter and um, Venus. Uh, Shukra, Shukracharya is the Daitanam Brahmam Guru. He's the supreme um, guru of the Daitas, of the Rakshasas, of the demons. 
anyhow, there's much symbology there. Perhaps we'll flesh that out in another podcast. But, you know, Mothery was given this really interesting boon. And the king was confident she would know the right course of action for Galava. So Galava was ushered into the princess's salon where he told her of his conundrum. Well, said Madhavi, I strongly suspect our destinies are tied, O Brahmin. Perhaps you can offer my hand in marriage to a proper suitor in exchange for the horses you seek. I wish to come with you and see where fate takes us. <laughs> Galava, intrigued, <laughs> as intrigued as he was confused by this this rather incredible and, and perhaps slightly unconventional uh, woman, he, he takes her up on his offer. Sure, what, what have I got to lose? <laughs> Who could refuse help in a sticky situation, yeah? So Balava and Madhavi make, make their way to the king of Kashi. Kashi is a, a beautiful name of what we now call Benares, which is an anglicization of Varanasi the holy city inhabited for the last 3,000 years-ish continuously on the banks of the Ganges of the Ganga. So they make their way to the king of Kashi. And he indeed has white horses with black, one black ear each. He has a number of them, indeed 200 such horses. He was a handsome and impressive man, and Madhavi's presence was as irresistible was uh, um, and Madhavi's presence was uh, irresistible, really, to, to most who feasted on her. The two were instantly attracted to each other. To Galava's great surprise, Madhavi asked the king, will you be willing to have me for a bride, but only for as long as it takes to produce a royal heir in exchange for 200 horses? <laughs> Galava, the, the, the concern for Madhavi's welfare, Calls her aside and says, hey, hey, you know, are you going to be okay, you know, with this king of Kashi? You know, in those times, such such action, such behavior, such such agency on behalf of women was certainly not, typically not possible or certainly not welcome. Uh, yes, but uh, the bold, <laughs> charming, unique Madhavi laughed in Galava's face. Oh, sweet Galava. How innocent you are, but worry not for me. It is not my fate to endure the judgment of such important men, nor to be bothered by the burdens of motherhood. <laughs> she went on to explain the nature of the boon that was granted by her grandfather, Shukra, Venus. I asked for the chance to traverse this world as a free spirit, to enjoy multiple partners and not have to be stuck raising children. Nothing short of a mystical boon can make that possible in this patriarchal world <laughs> where women are trapped to do men's bidding at every turn. Lord Shukra granted my wish, blessing me to have partners in the four corners of the world without reproach. He also blessed me to bear royal heirs each, but not to be fettered by raising them. I am blessed to remain pure in the eyes of petty men, to whom such matters are apparently so important. So, I know, I can feel that this is the right bidding of the boon. This year is my year with the King of Kashi. And I'm thinking this will be only the first leg of my adventures of my journey. Come back once I've had my fill of him and produce his royal heir, be raised in his palace. <laughs> Utterly lost for words. <laughs> both uh, both by virtue of his gratitude <laughs> and also by virtue of his astonishment at this arrangement, which was beyond reckoning as far as he could tell. Gullah simply submitted and agreed, you know, in submitting to the magnificent Madhavi. A year later, Galava receives the radiant Madhavi from the court of Kashi. And, you know, she'd had her fill. She looked lovely. Uh, she was ready to, ready to hit the road, so to speak. And they travel to the court of Ayodhya. As fate would have it, the king there too was without an heir. And he had white horses, each with one black ear. But again, only 200 of them. He too was a dashing young man whom Madhavi quickly took a liking to. So what does Madhavi do? <laughs> Madhavi proposes the same. Hey, how would you like to hang out with me and have a good time? And I could produce a royal heir for you. And in about a year or so, um, you know, I've got to go and you can raise the royal heir and that'll be that. What do you say? You're up for that? And he's like, yeah, where do I sign? Sure. So the, the magnificent Madhavi again 
spent a year with the king and produced an heir. And a year later, Gulliver returns to receive her. There was a skip in her step, and she was more radiant than ever, having enjoyed the comforts, companionship, and pleasure of a second dashing king, but without being bound to motherhood or marriage. The two of them sought out the final king rumored to have such horses, the king of Boja. So, again, we'll let the king, king court of Boja. They were astonished to be met with a familiar situation. I mean, not so astonished. The king had 200 such horses, completely white horses with a single black ear, which he was more than happy to trade for a year with the delightful Madhavi and a chance to procure a royal heir to his throne. So again, <laughs> Gulliver returns a year later to meet Madhavi. She had enjoyed all that she, she had learned and experienced at the court of Boja. Gulliver, however, was a little bit dejected. He still had only 600 horses. Now, compared to zero, that is a monumental feat to have 600 white horses with a single black ear. But that's still only three quarters of the dakshina that his guru had requested. So, you know, he shares with Madhavi about his dejection and that all of this was for naught. And he understands that she enjoyed herself and he was glad to give her a chance to do that. And he was very, very grateful for the horses they got. But he wasn't sure how to proceed. You know? Um, <laughs> the Madhavi comes up with this idea. Worry not, gentle Gulliver. I have heard of this guru of yours, of the sage of yours, and I know he has chosen a life of humble penance. But he too was once a great king. And, one imagines, he must therefore need an heir to install to his abdicated throne. She was intrigued by his stature and spiritual power and suggested they make the same bargain as they had three times before. But now I know what you meant, what you said the day we met, the Dalava Tamadavi, that our destinies are tied, replies uh, the beaming Galava. You are as brilliant as you are beautiful, Lady Madhavi. Vishabitra asked for 800 horses, knowing full well, like he knew he has precognition. He knows that only 600 such horses exist in creation. But he was utterly impressed at the perseverance of Galava, uh, and of course at the, the, the utter creativity <laughs> uh, of, of Madhavi, that they procure 600 such horses. And he also was very happy that he now had a means of procuring an heir. So he accepts the offer as payment in full. The son of Vishwamitra and Madhavi was named Ashtaka, and he was installed as Vishwamitra's royal heir. Having had their fill of world alliances, Madhavi renounces the world and retires to the forest for a life of contemplation. By the power of Madhavi's resourceful and resilient sacrifice, all 600 black ears all of the 600 black ears of the horses turned white. So now all 600 horses were pure white. And this was an omen signaling that Galava's train was complete and he now had the capacity to hear and to heed his guru's words and by extension those of everyone to whom he was speaking. Just as the female counterparts, the male gods, are considered the Shakti, the power of that god, so too do we see Galava's aims powered by the mighty Madhavi. Now, this is a fascinating <laughs> and unquestionably somewhat unconventional story. But what are we here for? Are you here to be bored? I think not. You're here to be entertained, intrigued, informed, perhaps even inspired. And to my mind, that story... Uh, checks all of those boxes. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the story a fraction as much as I've enjoyed telling it to you. Uh, and I hope that your ears were purified as you were hearing it. 
Um, feel free to come study with me. I would love for you to engage such teachings on a deeper level if that's your interest. In um, you can easily procure a monthly membership uh, for for uh, a very uh, reasonable uh, cost and have access to the entire catalog of over 20 courses at the school. Also, feel free to reach out if I can give service for one-on-one -on -one guidance or speaking or you name it. All right. Thank you very much for listening. Enjoy your day. <laughs> and keep contemplating both uh, student, student teacher relationships and um, creative solutions to difficult problems. Namaste. <laughs>